Well, hello there, Pearlside Church. Thank you so much for joining us once again for Pearlside at Home. And I just want to say thank you to all of you who helped support our food bank food drive this past week. Um, we collected over 2,700 pounds of food that's going to go to our food bank to help support our community. Thank you so much for doing that. And you're going to have more opportunities uh, to help serve our community. You go to pearlside.org slash cares for more information. Um, after Easter, Jesus' disciples went out into the world to share the gospel, to fulfill the mission that he called them to. In the midst of intense persecution, in the midst of a crisis that was uh, unparalleled in any time in history. I mean, I know it's difficult for us right now when we have to go out and go get groceries and different things, but the disciples were being hunted by the very people that killed Jesus. You had the Jewish authorities, the Roman authorities were all looking for them. When they left their homes, they were afraid of being arrested and put to death. It was a very difficult time in the early church, but yet they persevered and succeeded in their mission. And something about this that we can learn that will help us to succeed even in the midst of the challenge that we're going through is found here in scripture. And I want us to look at it today because it'll give us guidance on how we live in the midst of this crisis that we're facing. Make no mistake, what we're going through is very difficult. People are losing their jobs. There's crisis and trials in our homes. Um, People are dying still around the world. This is a bad crisis. But we can persevere just as the early church did if we learn these very important lessons. And so I want us to look here at 1 Timothy chapter 2. And this is something that the Apostle Paul, one of the early church leaders, wrote to a church congregation and to his disciple Timothy to encourage them in the midst of their crisis on how to succeed. And we pick it up here in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And he says this, First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people for kings and all who are in high positions, that we we may lead peaceful and a quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Look at what he says right at the beginning. First of all, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people people, the first thing that we need to do above all else, the most important thing that we need to do in this time is we need to pray. Yes, we need to follow the CDC's guidelines. Yes, we need to wear masks now when we go out in public. Yes, all these things that we're being told we need to do. But even above that, we need to pray. And oftentimes, that's not what we're doing. In the midst of crisis, we do all kinds of other things and prayer usually comes last. And what we want to say to us today as a church is we're calling our church to prayer. We need to pray. The title of my message is, What We Must Do Now. What We Must Do Now. And it's very simple. We need to pray. Take a look at what the early church did as they modeled this out. In the book of Acts 2.42, it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. Prayer was an integral part of the early church life, which led them to the breakthrough and the revival that we saw throughout history. It continues on. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Prayer brings breakthrough. Prayer brings revival. Prayer brings healings and miracles. And God has given us this gift and this call to pray. And now is our time to rise up and answer the call. What must we do now? We need to pray, Proside Church. The early Christians understood this. First of all, they needed to pray and they did it. There's an acronym I want to uh, share with you. It's, this, it's the word PUSH, P-U-S-H. What that stands for is pray until something happens. Pray until something happens. Oftentimes when we go through a crisis, we pray for a little bit and then we get bored, right? Or we get frustrated. How come the answer to prayer hasn't happened yet? And then we stop praying. But what we need to do in this season is we need to pray until something happens. And what that something is, is breakthrough. We need to pray until breakthrough happens. We need to pray until revival happens. We need to pray until the miracle happens. And you're going to hear an amazing story at the end that will illustrate this whole thing. But we need to pray. We're calling our church family, all of us, to prayer. Even if you're new and you've joined with us maybe just over the last couple of weeks and maybe you received the Lord for the first time on Easter last week, you can pray as well. Because prayer is simply talking to God. A lot of people say, you know, I don't know how to pray. Uh, My question is always, well, you know how to talk, right? (laughs) If you know how to talk, you know how to pray because prayer is talking to God. And it's, it's talking to God in a specific 
focus. And that's what we want to talk about here today. So what do we pray for? How do we pray until something happens? Number one in your notes is this, pray for God to move in power. Pray for God to move in power. It says in the verse that we just read that awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. The early church saw people healed. They saw people raised from the dead. They saw miracles break out. And that became a sign to the unbelieving world that believed in all kinds of other gods. Uh, you remember, this was a Greco-Roman world that they lived in. And so there were all kinds of Greek gods, the pantheon of gods that were being believed in. And it was also, uh, there were many other religions around at the time. And so when the Christians came on the scene, they began praying for miracles and signs. And when people started getting healed, guess what happened? people began to realize maybe your God is the true God. Maybe the gods that we've been believing in are no gods at all. So they began to pray in power and God showed up. Well, we live in a similar world today. Maybe it's not a, a pantheon of gods that we believe in, but we believe in money. We believe in success. We believe in power. We believe in all kinds of other things, science. And I'm not against science, obviously. Um, but when we pray in power and God shows up, it'll show the people around us that, Man, maybe the things that I've been placing my hopes in, maybe the things that I've been placing my expectations in, maybe there's something higher than that. Maybe there is a God that is supreme above all of that. And I don't think it's a coincidence that God during this crisis has allowed uh, the God of money to be shaken. Even the God of sports to many people and activities to many people, the God of success to be shaken because now all of these things are, are we're worried about them. I mean, Many people can't even have their high school graduations and their college graduations, and they don't know if they're going to have jobs after this is over. The whole world is turned upside down, and the gods of this world have been shaken. What we placed our trust in has been shaken. And you know what? When we pray and God shows up in the midst of this, it'll turn people's eyes and focus that there is a God in heaven who reigns supreme over everything in this world. We need to pray for God to move in power. There's a story that I heard and many of you maybe have seen on social media. It's the story of a man by the name of Lee McClellan. He's a minister in Belfast, Ireland, who was put in an isolation room because he had COVID-19. And his symptoms were so bad, he had to get placed in isolation. And, and, uh, but he shares his testimony on screen. And I want you to take a look at this because I want you to see how the power of prayer can come through in the midst of any crisis. So let's take a look at this together. There was two nights particularly in the hospital when I honestly didn't know whether I would make it or not. I was under incredible pressure. Got trips up and, and all that they needed to do. But I remember those nights particularly really crying out to the Lord and, and asking him to help me and asking him to even supernaturally just do something that would encourage me and bring me through and remember the next day I had a night from hell <laughs> and you got to understand this in, in the isolation ward when no one else can get in when no one else no pastor no friend, no family members when no one else was allowed in, God sent a cleaner. And all of a sudden this cleaner had come in and he was like a ray of sunshine. And he began to chat to me and he asked me how I was. And he began to talk to me and say to me about, about hanging in there. And then we got chatting and we got talking and he, and he turned around and he, and, and he said to me that he was a missionary in Nigeria for 14 years. And he began to tell me how God had saved many, many souls through his ministry. In just this last couple of years, he had found himself back home in Northern Ireland. And, and he's encouraging my heart. And he's telling me about souls and about the love of Jesus and the love of God. And I'm just sitting going, wow, when God needs to reach you, he knows exactly 
who is the right person. And in that moment of time, it was a cleaner. No one else could get in, God sent a cleaner. He left that day and then he says this as he stood at the door. He says, son, can I pray for you? I says, absolutely. And as he began to pray at the door, he couldn't touch me. <clears throat> as he began to pray at the door, he began to ask God the Holy Ghost to visit me. He began to ask God to heal my body and touch my lungs. He stood at that doorway and he pleaded with God Almighty to spur my life and to continue to use me. And then he left. And what was incredible was that after he left, <clears throat> he periodically would walk past my window and give me a thumbs up. That night, I remember, he started to turn around. Could it have been the prayer of a cleaner? That night, I began to desire a packet of prawn cocktail crisps, Kato. And I asked the Lord, because no one could get to me. And I says, Lord, is it possible that you could get me a packet of prawn cocktail crisps and a tin of Coke? Because that night I began to turn. The next morning, cleaner came. He brought in a bag, and in that bag was two oranges, a tin of Coke, and a packet of prawn cocktail crisps. Don't tell me that God doesn't know. God knows our every need. He knows every desire. And he just passed the bag through the door. He, he couldn't come in. And he just says, it's a gift from the Lord. I sat up. I had them crisps. God is a God, folks, who is personal. He knows the deepest desires of our hearts. He knows what we have need of. I want to encourage you out there today. God knows what you have need of. He knows your heart's desire. He is an incredible saviour. Never underestimate what God can do with you. Thank you to that cleaner. You know who you are if you ever see this. Thank you for hearing the voice of God and reaching someone like me. For you that are saved, keep your eyes upon him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And for you that doesn't know Jesus Christ, I would encourage you, lift up your eyes and look to heaven. And with a cry from your heart, say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And go home justified, just as if you had never sinned. May God bless you. May you know the love of Jesus and the power of the Holy Ghost. What a Savior. Amen. Wow, what an amazing story. I mean, there's power in prayer. There's nothing that God can't do. I mean, God can do miracles, healing, signs, and wonders, but very often He waits for us as Christians to pray and be a part of that miracle. You know, God can do it without us, but he chooses to involve us in bringing hope and healing to the world. And in that story, Lee McClellan was prayed for by a janitor, a cleaner, and that brought hope and healing into his life. And at the end of the day, God gets the glory, but it comes through our prayers. And if we look back at our first verse here that we read, it said, first of all, then I urge that prayers and supplications, and intercessions be made for all people. That's what our first move has to be. And sometimes, um, not everyone can have access to, to bring prayer and healing. In that case, it was a cleaner. He was the only one who had access to Lee. 
And maybe some of us right now, we're the only ones who have access that can pray for people. I think about in our church, we have tons of nurses and, and you may be the only ones that have access to patients in hospitals right now. God wants to use you to pray for them. I think about the, all of us shut up in our homes. I mean, we, we're the only ones that have access to our family members to pray for them if they're sick and if they need something. But we have to be bold and believe God for great things and not shrink back in fear, but rise up in faith in this time. And that's why he says, first of all, we need to pray. But I want you to look at the last part of that verse. It says, this is good and is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What is the point of our prayers? It's that people get saved and come to know eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that's got to be our heart. That as we take every opportunity to pray for God to come in power, it's that people will come to know him as their Lord and Savior. So we need to pray for God to move in power. We all can be that cleaner in someone's life. Maybe it's your next door neighbor. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe you're the only one who has access to pick up a phone and call a certain person who's struggling right now. Maybe they're struggling with depression. Maybe they're struggling with anxiety and fear or, or, or they're worried about their financial future. Maybe you're that person that can call them and pray for them and God would show up in power. The second thing we see is we need to pray for God to heal our land. Pray for God to heal our land. Second Chronicles 7, 14 says, if my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Notice the condition at the beginning of this passage. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, healing of the land comes as a result of the people humbling themselves and praying. And so, you know, every great revival in history was built on the foundation of prayer. I think about the, the first great awakening of Europe and North America, the second great awakening, the third great awakening, and, and, and there were so many others. They all came as a result of people praying and seeking God. As a result of that, millions of people come to faith in the Lord. Millions of people got saved and our culture was shaped by these great revivals when faith revived in the heart of our people. Well, our country is in need of a great revival right now. But if history tells us anything, it tells us that revival is going to be built on the foundation of prayer. And so we're calling our church right now to pray, all of us to believe God, praying for God to show up, to bring healing to our land for people to get saved, to come to know Jesus. But we also need to pray for our leaders. I think all of us are guilty of criticizing our leaders, whether it's the president, our senators, our governors, our mayors, whatever it is. All of us are guilty of criticizing, oh, why don't they do that? How come the rail's taking so long? Right? I mean, we, we all grumble about our leaders and let's just be honest. Um, but the Bible tells us that we need to pray for them. And how many of us would be honest and say, I haven't been praying for my leaders? One of the things that we need to do if we're going to see healing come to our land, we need to pray for our government leaders. We need to pray for their salvation, number one. But we also need to pray that they get the wisdom of God and to hear from the Lord and are not driven by political expediency or political agendas, but they're driven by really what is right for bringing uh, life and, and health to our people. We need to pray for them, not criticize them. We need to pray that God would heal our land through that. And in fact, that's what the Apostle Paul said, that we would pray for our leaders as well. So the verse says, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. In other words, we need to pray that they will lead us in such a way so that we can practice our faith and live the gospel out and share the gospel with the world. So we need to pray for our leaders. Will you join us in that? What must we do now? We need to pray for God to move in power. We need to pray for God to heal our land. And then thirdly, before we bring up our guests, we need to pray unitedly and continually. Unitedly and continually. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, again, I say, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. There is, when there is an agreement, Jesus is present. And sometimes we pray by ourselves and that's great. We need to do that. But we also need to gather other people around us and pray united with one another, praying the same thing, believing God for the same thing. It multiplies the effectiveness of our prayers. First Thessalonians reminds us we need to pray without ceasing. In other words, don't give up. 
When things get hard or when we don't see the result right away, it doesn't mean quit. It doesn't mean God is not going to move. It means we just need to keep on persevering and keep on praying. We don't control the results, but we can control our obedience to believe God and to pray unitedly and continually. There's a prayer movement going on around the world of which we are a part of. It's called Unite 714. The 714 is based off of 2 Chronicles 714 that we just read earlier. But it's churches literally all around the world uniting to pray at 714 every morning and 714 every evening, believing God to heal our land. And so for more information, you can go to our website, pearlside.org slash 714, and you can download a weekly prayer guide that we put out. We also go live on our social media at 714 every morning and every night to just rally and call us all to prayer, to give guidance in our prayers. And I want to invite you to pray. I mean, imagine what would happen if billions of Christians around the planet were to join together and pray about this one thing right now. I think we're going to see revival. What would happen if every single one of us just in in Hawaii would rise up and believe God and pray and begin to seek his face? I think we'd see revival here in Hawaii. You know, every revival in history, many of them at least, I'll say this, started with some kind of a crisis that the church gathered together to pray for and then revival broke out. Well, there's never been a crisis quite like this one in human history, a global pandemic that's affected global economies, that shut down churches on Easter globally. Well, this crisis is a prime opportunity for revival if the church will rise up and pray. If you'll pray, if I'll pray, if we'll pray together, I think we're gonna come into the greatest revival this world has ever seen. But the question is, Will we rise up and pray? Will we join together and will we pray? Because there's power in our prayers. Luke 11, verse nine through 10 says, ask and I tell you, it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks, it will be open. The imperatives here are continual. They're they're active. In other words, it, it doesn't say ask one time and expect it to be done. And if it doesn't happen, then quit, right? doesn't mean seek for a little while and then quit, knock and then quit knocking. No, it actually implies ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking until the door is open. It's a continual active imperative to all of us to ask and seek and knock until, to pray until something happens. So what must we do now? We need to pray and we need to cultivate in ourselves a lifestyle of prayer. And someone in our church who exemplifies this like nobody else is a woman by the name of Camille Omo. And many of you know her as Pastor Camille. Uh, But before she was a pastor, she was just Camille Omo. And it was in the storms of life that God taught her this lifestyle of prayer. And so I have her here with me today uh, to share with us so we can hear it straight from her how God built this into her soul. So help me welcome Pastor Camille Omo. Thank you for joining us, Pastor Camille. Thanks, Mr. Vail. Pastor Camille Omo is our women's and community pastor here at Pearlside, and she also oversees our prayer ministry, and she's an an amazing prayer warrior. And one of the situations in life that helped develop this in you was a crisis that you went through many years ago. Uh, You were working at one of our local hospitals as an administrator, Um, had four children at the time, which already requires a lot of prayer, I can only imagine. Um, And uh, you had the procedure done to no longer have any kids but yet you found yourself pregnant, uh, a miracle pregnancy, many would say. Um, but the doctors didn't say that. Uh, they actually told you that your life was in jeopardy, uh, the child's life would be in jeopardy, and if the child were to be born, um, might be deformed, uh, horribly uh, handicapped, and they strongly advise you to abort the child. This crisis taught you about prayer, it was in the office when he, the, my OB-GYN consulted with the other physicians and they highly recommended that I abort the child within three months because after three months, they're not going to do it. And it was then at that time, I sense I'm not going to, I don't believe in abortion. I'm, I'm going to keep this child. I'm going to fight. I have four and I'm going to have one more. And I just knew in my heart and us, we women, we have this unction and this Something that seven cents that you know what it's worth. You gotta fight. You just gotta fight. And it was at that moment, Pastor Bill, that I said, "No, we're gonna keep this child." And the doctor asked again, and again, all of them. And I said, "We're gonna keep this child." And um, you know, when you go through your pre- prenatal care, you you see the doctor once a month. 
I've seen him twice a month. And he keeps asking me up to the third month. And I said, no, I'm still going to have this child. And I pray every day from that moment. I've learned prayer. I cry prayer. I quote scripture. I did everything possible for nine months. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to have this child, regardless of what the doctor said. I called my sisters to pray with me. I called my friends to pray with me. Because there's moments when you're so vulnerable, it's like, oh my God, is this, is this real? It's going to happen? You know, there's a weak side, a feeling fearful side. But I didn't give up. I just travailed. I said, no, God, you said by your stripes I'm healed. And I remember that woman in Matthew, you said, you know, I just thought it was quoted scripture. It just it spews out of you. And I would lay my hands on my, my belly and I would speak life to this child to move. I would speak life, you know, and that's what I did for nine months. Wow. Never gave up. You gathered other people to pray mm -hmm. with you in unity and you prayed continually yes. for a long period of time. Now you're in the delivery room. The doctors are all there. All the doctors that said to, you should abort this child. Um, what happened in that delivery room when the baby now was born? You know, if I just may say, before I get, go there, Pastor Bill, it, the prayers were so intense and deliberate, so travailing that nothing will stop you from believing that there can be a miracle. Nothing's going to stop you from saying it's going to be okay. And no matter what the outcome is, God's in control. And it was at the delivery room, um, because prior to that, the other four children, I would see the birth of the child, the big, large mirror, and they would place the child on my, on my chest. And that would just be a fulfilling motherhood time. But this child, the doctor recommended that he drape the mirror, and I went berserk. I went crazy. I said, take that off the mirror. I want to see the birth of the child. But the doctor refused to to strip that sheet off. He said, for your best interest, we're going to keep the sheet on. And I cried, I panicked, and I kept praying, and I spoke in the heavenly language, and I kept praying. I went hysterical. And it's when I, on the third push, when the child came out, and the doctor slapped him for the first time, and there was no cry. Then he slapped him the second time, and I said, God, Breathe life into him. I, I prayed out loud where everybody could hear me. I said, in the name of Jesus. And the second slap, he didn't cry. And I kept praying and I didn't stop praying. I was crying at the same time. I was so emotional. And it was on the third slap that he cried. He breathed. And I said, thank you. I, I yelled out, thank you. And then the doctor asked, do you want to know what sex? Do uh, you want to guess what sex? I said, it's a boy. He says, you're right. I said, does he have 10 fingers? And um, does he have 10 toes? And he says, yes. And I said, okay. And I expected him to bring the child to me, but he just wrapped the child up and the specialist just took him to the next room. And I went crazy. And I cried, I spoke a lot, and I, I prayed. And they actually had to calm me down by injecting me with something to keep me calm. But I kept praying through it all. I, I refused to give up. They had to inject you with sedatives to stop you from praying, yeah. but you kept on praying. Um, I wouldn't say. Wow, what a... What, what, an, what a moment there. I mean, I, I can only imagine the, the feeling of, you know, needing to fight and to keep on fighting and to not stop fighting this whole time and to come to this moment now uh, where they, they took him away from you. You must have been wondering what, what's wrong, right? Um, what happened next? Well, um, it was hours in the recovery room. And, you know, you count every minute was an hour. And I, was, I kept praying. I kept saying, God... You gave me this child. Father, you bring this child. No matter how the child looks, no matter what it is, I'm going to keep this child. It's a boy. And, you know, I, I, you, you start babbling. You just start keep praying. Just you you praying, can't keep yeah. silent. You can't keep silent because you're waiting for an answer. You're waiting for results. And then doctor comes in, my ob -Joyen, the three of them, they come in. And he's, the child is all wrapped up in a baby blue blanket with a baby blue beanie and booties. And he, quote, unquote, he said, Here's your miracle child. Wow. And he placed that child in my hands, and I wept, <laughs> and I cried, and I thanked God, and I continuously prayed even after, thank you, God, mm -hmm. thank you, God. And Pastor Bill, I didn't pay one cent for the child. The doctor paid all the bills, prenatal care, the whole wow. hospital bill. He was a free baby. Wow. <laughs> I was wow. blessed. <laughs> miracle upon miracles. I mean, you literally pushed you yes. know, you prayed until something happened and then you pushed and you didn't stop praying until after it was over and then you gave thanks to God yes. after that. I think that's yes. just a, such a perfect picture of what prayer is and, um, 
And praise God. And so, you know, the baby is no longer a baby. He's now 40 years old. Uh, and uh, many of us know him as Pastor Ki Omo. There he is there with his wife, Chanel. And they have children of their own. And uh, what the doctors said couldn't happen. You believed and you fought for in prayer. And the Lord made it happen. Yes. And uh, I think that's just such a perfect example of everything that we're talking about here. Because if you just looked at the facts and what science was telling you, you would have aborted Pastor Keith. Yes. Um, yes. But you decided that you were going to pray. You are going to fight. Not ignore the facts, but pray. And uh, today we have a miracle. And our, all our church got to hear him preach the last couple of weeks. And what, what, an, awesome, what an awesome moment there, Pastor yeah. Camille. Um, that's just one amazing moment in your life. Uh, there are many others, but I want to highlight one more. Um, you were still working at Kuokini. You got word over the, the speakers that someone had passed away. Yeah. A patient had died. Yes, I was in the emergency room, and we're, uh, the social worker and I were discharging a patient. And over the intercom, it says code 500, but it was after the code, I heard this still small voice it's not his time. It's not his time. And they said, oh, Mr. No, he's cold. He's not going to make it. Then I ran up the stairs. But along the way, I just keep hearing, God said, it's not his time. So I told my boss, I'm going up to the unit. Um, please pray for me. So I'm running up the stairs, and I'm asking this other nurse, could you please pray for me? Where's Mr. Noni? And she said, he passed. God said, it's not his time. And I remember saying, God said, God said. And she looked at me, and she said, no, he, he is dead, Camille, because it's here on the document. I said, give me a minute. Just give me a minute. And I, I just need to go in there and please. And so she said, okay, here's a minute because the family's coming. They already prepared the body for view. And so I just went in there and I drew the curtain and I looked at his body. And here's this dead man. And I heard God said, it's not his time. And I said, okay, God, you said it's not his time. And I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I, I think I'm crazy. I, there's so much things going on in my head. But God's voice trumped every emotion. I looked at this dead body and I said, Mr. Noni, I don't know you. You don't know me. I, I remember <laughs> saying that to a dead body. But God said, you're not dead. And in the name of Jesus, I said, I speak life to you. And then I thought to myself, do I say, Lazarus, rise? No, you know, it's, it's, it may sound funny, but you're going through fear. You're going through so much yeah. emotions, but by his stripes, you're healed. And I just walked around and I believe that he's going to get up and I believe he's going to walk out with me. I, just, I just, con just constantly prayed and pushed and travailed in. I was hoping he would walk out with me, he would wake up, but he didn't. Mm. I went to my office put up my after lunch sign. I told my boss, please pray for me because I don't believe that man is dead. And she wasn't a believer then. But she said, okay, uh, I'll, I'll do what you say to do. And I went in out and I prayed more. I travailed more. I never gave up because that voice was so loud. It's not his time. In the name of Jesus, I speak life to this man. I speak life. And I kept walking back and forth in my office. I, I, I didn't care about time. I just kept doing it. I just had, I had the sense of urgency and deliberate, desperate prayer. And that's all I did in my office. And then my beeper ran off. Then they overhead paged me. Then my boss came to my door. He said, they want you up at the unit. And I said, okay. I was, I was still praying. I wasn't thinking. And I mean, thinking wisely anyway, and I went up to the stairs and the nurse that said that he's dead, she said, you're not gonna believe this. He's not dead. And I looked at her and I said, I told you so. <laughs> I told you so. And she looked at me, I, I'll never forget her expression. And I said, may I just go peer in? She said, go ahead. So I went in, I saw the family there. I saw him sitting up and I, I looked and I, thank, I said, thank you, God. And, I went down back to my office. I went to the after lunch sign. I told my boss what had happened. I told the girls what had happened. I went back to my office and I started to praise God and thank him because um, he used an ordinary person like me to do such an extraordinary thing for him, God, his glory. Wow. And I was just so thankful that I listened and I obeyed. Wow. What, what, what stands out to me is that you got other people to pray with you and then you continue to pray over a long period of time because he was dead for over an hour. Yes. Isn't that right? And so a lot of time went by, but you kept on praying, you kept on believing, and you kept on seeking God, and you kept on pushing until yes. something happened. Yes. And God showed up 
in such a powerful way. I mean, prayer is powerful, isn't it? I mean, um, what we're going through right now with this pandemic, I mean, we need to pray. I mean, that's mm-hmm. what this is all about. And, and calling us as a people, ordinary people like you, to just continue yes. to believe God and pray. And so, Pastor Kimo, thank you for that. You know, what we are uh, going through right now um, in this pandemic should call all of us to this place of prayer. I remember Mr. Naone came to church because that's when I first started coming to church. And I remember meeting him and uh, he, got, he got saved at Pearlside after that happened. And uh, a bunch of other people from the hospital uh, mm-hmm. got saved yeah. as well. And uh, many of you may be listening right now. Um, Pastor Camille, what would you say to us uh, in this time? Have faith. Trust God and trust his word and don't give up. Keep praying, keep pushing until something happens. Um, consistently stay in prayer. Be consistent in prayer. It, it's not about feelings anymore, especially when you're desperate or you're, you're deliberately pushing through. It, it, it's, it's not about emotions. It's about faith because faith pleases God. And I just take the word of God and I support it with faith and I just push it through and until something happens. There is breakthrough. There is, um, there is going to be God's perfect will. You know, if I gave up one key, this is his will for key. But if I gave up too early, it wouldn't happen. And it's those moments that when you're ready to give up, it's just that one more faith push of prayer that brings forth the miracle. Just keep pressing in until something happens. Amen. You prayed continually. You gathered others to pray with you in unity. And you prayed for God to show up in these moments and many others. And he has. Yes. And he's now developed in you a faith to continue to contend and to be the prayer warrior that you are. And, you know, many people, you know, I know myself, we look at you now and we go, well, of course, Pastor Camille raised a dead person. That's what she does, you know. Um, but we don't realize all these small things that happened that built you into the person that you are. And I can't help but think that what we're all going through with this COVID-19 is part of God laying that foundation in every single one of us to have a faith that can believe God for amazing things just like you did. And so we need to lean into that. We can't just say, well, that's for someone else to pray for that. We'll let Pastor Camille pray that the disease goes away. No, we all need to lean in and fight in this time because God's trying to do something inside of each one of us to build a faith Mm -hmm. like Pastor Camille has today. Mm So Pastor Camille, can you pray for us during this time that we would have the faith and believe God for great things even in the midst of this crisis? Amen. Pearlside Church, will you bow your heads with me as Pastor Camille leads us in prayer? Thank you, Father. We thank you in advance for what you're already doing in the midst of chaos and through this crisis. We pray for our government leaders, our president, our governor, our mayor. We cradle them in the palms of our hands as we lift them up to you, that you would give them wisdom and discernment, dear God, during this time to lead your people. I pray for every household, even now, where there's fear, faith would arise, Mm -hmm. and where there's hopelessness, hope. Father, I pray that everyone, even now, would intensify their prayer and trust in you and cry out to you and desperately seeking you, and they will find you as they seek you. May all our hearts turn back to you, dear Mm -hmm. God, May every salvation, even now that's been spoken, Father, be cherished by you because you are a great God. We thank you in advance what you're doing, dear God. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our homes with your presence and your power. Bring forth your presence and your revelation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Pastor Camille. Pearlside Church, join with us in prayer. Every, every day, and we're going to continue to believe God for great things as we seek him, as we unify with one another, and we pray continually. God's going to bring breakthrough. Pray with us, church. Thank you for joining us today. God bless you guys.